Welcome to this week's episode of The Modern Good. I'm your host, Busy Gold. Conscious construction starts right now. Hey everybody, I'm Busy Gold and this is another episode of The Modern Good. I'm here with Sam. She is a radical free birth advocate. She's got her master's in alternative medicine and she has created a whole bunch of things that we're going to go into in depth, all of which are most certainly bucking the system and trying to rebuild (laughs) for sovereignty. So Sam, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to talk with you. So When I started to pull together this episode, a lot was coming through. And those of you that have been listening to the show for a while know that a lot of the way the shows come together is most certainly God led. And this is no different. When I started to get really clear on where I wanted to take this episode, I tried to allow that to craft itself first. And then I went and looked at all of Sam's background and it felt like it was just the perfect fit and there'd be no better person to have this conversation with than her. So in having some of these preparation conversations, I think I started to dig deeper into the Western medical establishment as I often do. And In this show, we tend to look at everything through a mental health or at least partial mental health trauma priming lens. And it's always gotten me to my core that obstetrics and gynecology as a practice are absolutely stress and trauma inducing. And as I started to kind of dig into this rabbit hole, I started to uncover a lot about the history that makes all the sense why it would be so trauma inducing. So when I found that, I decided that this was what I wanted to chat with Samantha about. And I think what we're going to uncover for you today may certainly be very triggering for some of you. And I want to preface this episode with, we don't go into these things just for clickbait. We're not doing this just to ruffle feathers. We're trying to have conversations that ultimately will help you regain body sovereignty and get your life going in a way that's actually for your good instead of for the good of the system. And often to do that, we've got to uncover some dark, decrepit systems in the background (laughs) that no one wants to talk about. Like no one wants to talk about what we're going to talk about today. It's not like everyone's like, yippee, I can't wait to jump on Sam and Busy's episode, but you should still be listening to it. It's still really important. So I think when we're going into today's conversation, keep in mind for some of you that have had trauma at the hands of the hospital in your birth, trigger warning. For those of you that have had any sort of triggering trauma induced experience at the hands of a doctor, trigger warning. You know, I think we take all of these feelings that might be coming up when we're even just thinking about hospitals, doctors, this idea that there's one way to care for yourself. And if you're not going with the way the system wants you to care for yourself, somehow you're crazy or you're anti-science. I think my hope today is that we start to see that there's a lot more nuance to this. And when we really dig in some of that guttural feeling that you have of like, Oh, something feels so wrong here. Like that's based in truth. And my hope is that Samantha and I can kind of pull back the curtain in a way that naturally it will be triggering for some of you. And, you know, we're here to support you through that. But I think our intent is to get you across the finish line to realize that maybe some of those things feel really triggering and trauma inducing because they are, they're based in some sort of truth. Their etiology is based in something that is ultimately in its original intent, not for your good, not for your well-being. So I want to start this episode by digging into some of where Sam has now gotten into her practice. Obviously, you started off very much going the academic route, going the route of, you know, the degree, the name on the wall. And obviously, you've gotten to a place in your life where you've relinquished those things. (laughs) What led you to relinquish? Like, what was this pivotal moment for you that was like, you know what, all of this is, it's not for me or is it that maybe those things are somehow chaining you in some way? I'd love to know what that experience was for you. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, everything you just said is so true. And I love that um, Dr. Gabor Monte calls it like, you know, if you're triggered, it's because there's ammunition there, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's this opportunity to trigger into awakening and um, to reevaluate the experiences that you've had to come to peace with them, you know? So mm -hmm. anyway, um, I was very disillusioned by Western medicine from a very young age because of a chronic illness that was that I dealt with that led me to just brick walls at every turn in the allopathic system. So very early on, I became aware of alternative traditional practices. And I was, I, and so I started to go down that route. But like you said, with the degree, like moving towards a naturopathic degree, and I was a certified doula, and I thought about becoming a licensed midwife. And I was a yoga teacher running, you know, a yoga studio that was certified by Yoga Alliance and trying to gain all of the legitimacy that mm. those licensures offer. Because you're taught, obviously, right, that if you don't have licensure, you don't have credibility. And when you're in an alternative system, uh, you're fighting for credibility all the time, right? Especially when it's so intentionally, maliciously made out to be just a bunch of crap, right? Um, and so, but it wasn't until COVID happened. Um, and then simultaneously, I also had my first daughter and started to take her to a, a naturopath and then also a licensed midwife. And in both scenarios realized how much naturopathy licensed midwifery had become the system that they pretend to oppose mm -hmm. but I love that it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing so it's almost worse because they are stand they're putting themselves out there as the alternative as putting the patient first as giving choices and bodily autonomy and all of these things but at the same time now because of licensure which we can get into they're they're pushing a top down agenda that is inherently disempowering to the client patient um, individual and it was like oh wow okay there is no way to fight the system from the inside it's just draining people's energy to try to change it from the inside the only option is to start to build an alternative and you know that makes the <laughs> yeah that makes the old system obsolete basically so and yeah. would you say because I know for a lot of people when it's just them they can kind of push through it find workarounds and then often having a child, you tend to see it from a different perspective, right? Because then you're thinking multi-generationally. Well, it's like, well, now it's not just like, I can get through it. It's like, do I want my kid to actually be raised in this? Do I want to actually put my support behind something like this and co-sign it? Or is the way that I'm teaching my child inherently going to put what I'm doing and saying in conflict, right? I find that often if we're parenting in a way that I believe we should all strive to parent, our child should start to notice those inconsistencies. Oh, well, mommy says this and this and this, but then she's taking me to this and this and this, you know, what's going on here. And I would imagine for a lot of people that that is what they need to change, right? They need to not just see it for themselves, but see what they're participating in for the future generations. So was that a motivating factor for you in trying to break away? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like the message I was giving to my, you know, infant and the message I was giving to my clients was you don't need an outside authority to tell you what to do with your illness or whether you're sick or not. Like you don't need a test. You need to learn to intuit. But then at the same time, being a new mom, obviously, and just wanting that external validation, I was taking my daughter to all her like usual appointments, right? Which like the concept of a well appointment is just silly that we're just being put into this system to go in basically as 
you know, a money-making machine um, to see a doctor when we're not sick or to have our child checked by a doctor when we're not sick, because it's, it's ingraining into them this message that you need someone else to tell you what's happening in your body. You're not Mm -hmm. smart enough or don't have the authority to tell your, to know what's happening in your body. And so I noticed this cognitive dissonance in myself that I was still bringing her wanting someone else to tell me that she was okay, even though I knew she was okay. Right. And so it, it challenged me to like really lean into, okay, I don't need anyone else to tell me that my daughter is okay or not okay, or she needs this or that or whatever. Um, And the more that I could lean into that, the more I realized like that participation in the system wasn't, wasn't serving her or me. Um, And that, yeah, if I was going to live what I was teaching her, it was to opt out entirely. So I feel like a lot of the way the Western medical system gets us to opt in to the idea of well visits is to pitch it as, well, it's prevention, right? Like we want to catch things before they happen. This is what I find interesting about that. And I'm not saying that obviously in certain circumstances, surely that does happen, right? Surely some kids have had things found during well visits that ultimately have saved her life, saved her him, their (laughs) lives. So I think it's important for us to recognize, I know that we have some people watching the show that of course prevention is a part of it, but I think where my brain immediately wants to take this is looking at this seesaw effect of for the small percentage where prevention ends up saving their life versus all of the rest of the people that are surely in the majority where this actually becomes a system of indoctrination that, like you said, gets them to always look to somebody else like, well, the doctor, the doctor. I know a lot of doctors. Doctors do not have it all figured out. In many ways, doctors really don't have it figured out. I'm going to try to find a nice way to say that. Their entire process of schooling little by little chips away at them, breaks them down you know, let's call it what it is. I mean, they basically like what you would go through in like a buds training, right? Where you're sleep deprived, they're pushing you to your absolute limits while literally making you memorize information and recall it. And it's essentially the same sort of training, right? Which teaches you how to think like the system rather than think like yourself. A lot of doctors that I've worked with in my career, and I've spent actually a good chunk of my career helping doctors kind of exit the establishment, so to speak, and to bring their gifting out into the world and find a new iteration of their medical practice. Often they spend all these years thinking like the system only to hit a certain amount of cases where they're like, I mean, I knew that and I kept thinking of it like the system. So I missed it. And there usually needs to be this moment where they actually realize that they have to wrestle with the system and be like, you've programmed me not to see what's right in front of me. Therefore, something has to be wrong, right? We just kind of prevention over everything when the reality is that the very thing that shirt sure, might prevent death for some people ends up priming an entire majority into like you said, needing to look outside of themselves for help or thinking that somehow someone has like some sort of magical cure, of course, in the form of some sort of Western pharmaceutical that's going to change everything for them when I think we all see that that is inherently untrue, right? Often, and I think most doctors that have exited the system will tell you that most of the interventions that they make end up requiring another intervention and another intervention, right? Next thing you know, it's trying to blanket or band-aid symptoms that are ultimately not anywhere close to treating the root, which I know is something that you're very intentional about in the way you've built your collective. Yeah. And it's, and it's not that doctors are bad people, right? You just described how they go in with the best of intentions and it's what the education is offering to them. That's really intentionally making it like cogs in a wheel and Mm -hmm. what you just described, you know, that type of, um, practice separates them from their own intuitive healing power. Right. And, um, 
not only that, but then they're looking at the body as a separation of body and mind, which we know scientifically now that the body mind cannot be separated. Right. And so the, like you said, treating, you know, this pill for that, this pill for that, and never getting to the root cause, never looking at the whole person. And it's interesting what you said about prevention as well, because when we look at statistics about prevention, what we know is that actually in areas where that have the highest rates of screening testing and highest rates of doctor's visits, um, that death rates and um, like poor outcomes for diseases are actually also the highest because our intervention tends to increase mortality rates and increase poor outcomes for disease. And so it's actually like people who are not diagnosed with certain things have better outcomes, which just flies in the face of this whole idea of prevention. Mm -hmm. Obviously that is not the case for everyone. There are obviously exceptions to that rule who are definitely helped by these types of screenings, but the vast majority are not um, you know, this idea of preventative medicine isn't actually doing anything good for us. Well, and I think we can both establish that the real preventative medicine would be likely nutritional, supplemental, and mental health in nature, right? And I don't mean mental health in the Western scope, <laughs> but different approaches to addressing that mind-body connection that you're referring to. Exactly. So I think from the perspective that I'm at, and I think this goes in line with your statistic, once you have been diagnosed as something, they're like, oh, well, you're, you know, you've got all the markers for this. And now we need to test for this. Your body goes into a stress response and the body is very in tune. So if you accept that diagnosis that a doctor has just given you, you basically become that. So I'm not surprised that where screening is the highest death rates are the highest because we often become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, well, I have this. And then you actually tell your body, oh, we have this. And then you play that out to varying degrees. Whereas people exactly. that don't know that they had something, if you end up finding, like we've been talking about these root causes, sometimes that can just naturally heal itself when you find and treat the root. So I think a lot of people on our show, I think see the human body that way. And I think certainly some of our listeners do not. Um, for those of you that do not, I encourage you to go do some digging. Like we're in a time and space right now where digging on this topic is highly censored. So Sam, do you have any good resources that you would send these people that are currently not seeing the world the way we do so that they can go do some research knowing that it's highly censored where would you send them yeah um I mean the work of Dr. Gabor Mate who just came out with a new book called the myth of normal I already mentioned him anything concerning mind body he tends not to be censored as much because he really walks the middle of the mainstream but um the work he's doing about psycho emotional health and bodily health is definitely important to us moving forward um sayer g and kelly brogan they have a web or sayer g has a website um and i'm gonna forget the link but i will I will send it to you um, that has, it's like a database of natural medicine studies accumulated in one place. So you don't have to like pour through the literature to try to dig them out. I want to say it's like green med info or something. And he also has a great book called regenerate, which is a lot of citations of um, it, the basics of everything that we're talking about the way that we misunderstand the body and how we need to, if we want to achieve true health individually and as a collective, reprogram the way we think about our body on every level. Um, so those are some good kind of basic places to get started. Okay. Well, that's amazing. And Kelly Brogan is most certainly highly censored because she <laughs> got yeah. attacked on mass during COVID. Oh, <laughs> that was fun. It was like yeah. me, Dr. Mercola, Kelly Brogan, Christian oh, he's, Northrop. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those others are also great resources as well. Yes. There, I mean, I think there are a lot of doctors and I will, I'll say this, and this is obviously my perspective. I think that 
over the last two and a half years, if your doctor or someone that you know that is in the medical field to some degree didn't stand up to some level, obviously the way everyone stands up is going to be slightly different. But if you know somebody like that, that didn't actually kind of get out of their own way and be like, you know, something's a little bit off here and they're your doctor and they're in charge of your health, that might be a good sign that you need to exit stage left. Every solid doctor that I know, some not publicly because they have a social media presence and are too afraid. And I, I understand that. I don't know that I respect it, but I understand it. A lot of people that I know at some point, obviously varying points in time, but they all eventually came out yeah, and spoke out about this. I know. And it's unfortunate that more people didn't take a public stance on it. Um, mm -hmm. not just because, you know, of strength and numbers, but you have to think if they really care about their patients or people that trust them, how many people's lives could have gone differently if they had said something. Um, I under, I agree with you that like, I understand why people, get sucked into, you know, feeling like it's better to have a platform that they can change people's lives in other ways, but people's lives were so horrifically changed by the consequences of the past few years. I'm seeing that with a lot of my clients now, um, that you wonder if someone that they trusted had said something, would mm -hmm. it have been different? Yeah, and I think maybe as we kind of segue into a bit more of the history pieces here, you know, if you're watching this and you do have a social media following or you do have a community that somehow engages with you, looks up to you, comes to you for feedback, maybe really sit with this for a moment because I, you know, I'm not in any way trying to be a pessimist, but I highly doubt we are, I know a lot of people want to believe that like, we're on the edge of a renaissance, man, and everything's <laughs> going to get better. Um, I don't think that's going to happen too soon. I mean, I think we probably have at least a few more years of challenging, contentious times ahead of us. So I think this is a good moment where it does kind of feel like we're almost in this like pause or suspended animation where it's like, we don't really know what's going to happen next, but it doesn't really feel like things are getting better this might be a really great time to look in the mirror and, and have a little chat with yourself about what you will do next time. Because I know nobody likes this analogy, but it's kind of like the low hanging fruit analogy. When things started to happen in World War II Germany, at first a lot of people were like, oh, well, it's not happening to me, right? Like you, you keep kind of just like trying to toe the line, be a people pleaser, not ruffle feathers until it gets so close to you that then you have to say something. I think, I hope that we've all learned our lesson that it's okay if you're speaking from a place of genuine concern and you're even allowing yourself to be curious rather than like, this is what it is, speak up soon and often. Don't be afraid to ask questions because I think we can all see that this last round, people didn't speak up soon enough. People didn't speak up in a large enough group. We just allowed a bunch of things to steamroll us as a civilization globally that really never needed to happen. You know, we see now we're looking at the news and people are like, well, we didn't do this or, well, we didn't do that. It's like the amount of trust that the general public has in like old white men in lab coats is unbelievable to me. And I think it does certainly segue into what we're talking about today, where it's like you get indoctrinated into just like, look at the man in the white lab coat as somehow a God when that is certainly not in any way, shape or form the case. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about this all the time, but people, even if they have an inkling that's, that's not correct or something is wrong, uh, they just really want someone else to make the ultimate decisions for them or to mm -hmm. be able to blame if something goes wrong or to just outsource their authority to so that they don't have to think critically or take responsibility. This is why we love the idea of genetic diseases. Like, mm, oh, I, I can't that. do anything about it. It's my genes. Like this is like the ultimate cop-out and people really 
like it's so it plays so deeply into our worst human tendencies, unfortunately. Um, and I also think like people's resistance to speak out is even if they, you know, have realized over the past couple of years that things weren't what they seem, whether they are a doctor or just someone who was participating in the Western medical route, there's like this little bit of shame or they like, we need to have forgiveness with ourselves, even if we've been participating in it up to this point, even if we did all the things and we think we should have known better. So that's why I, I feel like I know a lot of people who have a little bit of resistance to speaking out because of that. They're like, well, who am I to speak out now? I've been participating this entire time, but we have to be able to forgive ourselves to move forward. You know, And I think maybe in tandem with that, a lot of times the people that are very much pro the agenda, towing the line, saying all the things that the media tells you to say, they're the ones actually that get really aggressively attacking and cancel culturally with people. I would say that on the flip side, when you eventually wake up and you're like, oh my God, really the people that have been kind of awake or at least asking questions the whole time, they're very much not the shaming type of people. They're like, a, okay, thank God, welcome back. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when you come from that sort of mental programming, it's, it's the easy step to think that everybody thinks that way when the reality is that all the people that have been willing to be like, well, that doesn't really make sense with that, that are just willing to ask some very simple questions, not even formulating hypotheses, just like on its face, these things don't make sense. Anyone agree? these people are not the ones that are going to be like, you don't get to come on the boat because you used to be against the boat. It's like, we just don't, we don't do that. We're just like, welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry that happened. Yeah. Glad it's, to have it, you. Exactly. But it's, it's all based in that fear of the trauma, the trauma that's inflicted on us from such a young time. Right. Which yeah, and I really like that idea of outsourcing your authority. I mean, I don't like the idea to be clear of outsourcing your authority. I think we should not do that, but <laughs> I like just the, that sort of framework, which is really over time, right? You're taught to put your blind trust or faith in kind of the figure in the white lab coat. When the reality is that a lot of our exchange with that system is actually very much inducing stress and trauma and things that actually when we go into fear our decision making process after that becomes very gray or hectic and doesn't always or often yield good outcomes so right. i think let's take a moment to go back and kind of paint the picture of some of this history and i i think you know because you tend to be naturally in your career centered more around I mean, I think maybe you don't just have women in your practice, but I think like female care, the kind of doula midwifery thread certainly seems to be something that you're at very least passionate about, yeah. which led me to kind of pull this thread that's really horrifying. Hmm. Um, what At what point did you start to do some digging or research around what the actual roots of obstetrics in the West were? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, so I became a doula um, really young, around 18, and I saw several births, hundreds of births in the hospital, and um, it never seemed right. I never saw a birth where the mother came out feeling well, emotionally well afterward. Um, I Even if she had had a natural birth, mm -hmm. which natural birth can't really happen in the hospital, but, or a vaginal birth, she never came out feeling empowered. And, um, there was always a lot of emotional healing to do afterward. And then as a doula, you're really taught to like, be a punching bag for trauma because you're in the room, you're witnessing this inherently traumatic experience and you're taught not to intervene on behalf of the mother at all and to always to always do whatever the doctor says whatever the nurses say and just always submit to the authority of the doctor so it never sat well with me I knew I didn't like the work but I couldn't I didn't quite have the concept 
of why. Um, and I knew, but I knew that when I would have a baby, I would always, I was definitely going to have a home birth and I didn't have a lot of experience with home birth midwives. So I didn't, I didn't, I thought that that was like the Holy grail of birth experience was to have a home birth midwife. Um, and it was a good friend of mine who, when I became pregnant said, have you read this book unassisted childbirth, um, by Laura Kaplan Shanley. And I read that and my mind was blown. Um, and she's one of the like OGs on this concept of free birth, which is really just birth without a licensed attendant, which is really just the way women have been giving birth for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, and, 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 through that and through the work of the Free Birth Society and hearing other women's stories was really awakened to the ways that home birth midwives who are licensed and who are chained to their licensure requirements can like not maliciously, but just by the nature of the system inflict the same types of tra traumas and traumatic environments on mothers during a home birth. Um, as is done in the hospital. And so st that led me to start to dig into a little bit of the history of midwifery and, okay, why is midwifery licensed now? What was midwifery like before it was licensed? Um, and then that goes hand in hand with like the history of obstetrics and kind of how we got to where we are today, where the majority of babies were born at home just 200 years ago. And now uh, less than 1% of babies are born at home. Um, and that even includes, you know, with licensed midwives present. So, so yeah, it's definitely um, a real testament to the way the system works that they were able to so quickly and completely <laughs> shut down um, not only home birth, but certainly the idea of birthing without an attendant is like a lot of women think it's illegal because it's so vehemently uh like you know fought against it's not illegal um it's perfectly legal for you to have whoever you want in your birth but many women don't even consider that as an option because it's been so effectively stamped out of the collective consciousness well and probably through either horror stories of friends that have had things go wrong or through watching movies, right? We have this, we're painted this picture of what happens during birth, you know, with like the screaming and the like punching the husband and being like, yeah, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think we're all pitched. Mm -hmm. I can say from having four births, all four completely different. Yeah. And a lot of people would think that my most traumatizing birth would have been my birth with Sarai, where she actually died for 20 minutes. Oh mm. no, my most traumatizing birth. And today's a fitting day to have this conversation because <laughs> it's his ninth birthday. My most traumatizing birth by far was the only birth I've had in the hospital. Mm. It was when you talk about like losing bodily autonomy, it was in my life, it is the most I've ever lost authority over my own person at the hands of multiple people. Like just thinking about it immediately starts to make me feel anxious. Mm. It was literally 12 hours of actual hell in a hospital, realizing that I had basically signed things over, even though I was fine. Like there was, there wasn't an elevated heart rate. There was no need for me to have any intervention that I had other than I had nurse ratchet who just wanted to like get me done before her shift was over. Mm -hmm. It's still to this day, if I think about it, like it, you know, and I'm sure mine was like probably nothing compared to what's happened to some women, of course. But to me, those 12 hours of having a doctor somehow have the legal authority to do whatever they wanted to me against my will, even though I knew it was not in the best interest of me or my baby to this day will be one of the biggest regrets of my life. Yeah. And all trauma is trauma, right? Like there's no mm -hmm. scale of like whose was worse or whatnot, but it's, it's a sad thing that a lot of women don't realize when you're stepping into that environment, you are giving up choice to an mm -hmm. extent and not 
you know, because of the way that, yeah, the way that the system works and the way that the cascade of interventions is set up to send you on this certain path. It's the attitudes of, um, you know, the L and D staff who might be well-intentioned, but just most of them have never seen an physiological uninterrupted birth before in their entire education or work mm -hmm. history. So how could they know any differently? They don't have the um, awareness to not F it up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then you're also in this highly vulnerable, like psychic state during the birth experience. So you're in not the worst really... environment possible, right? Literally like the worst ever. <laughs> not in a good position to having to be advocating for yourself in that way. Um, and so, yeah, it usually leads to, you know, a really bad situation for a lot of women. And this is a, another example of the way that women kind of, that the, the way that the system has like somehow convinced us to advocate for our own enslavement because so many women will vehemently defend their hospital births and that they had an amazing experience in the hospital or that none of this was, you know, an issue and don't want to look at it um, at the ways that maybe they did feel violated or things didn't go the way that they wanted or they'll brush it off or whatever. Um, and again, it's kind of like, because we're not quite ready and willing to see how we partially co-created that process by making, you know, the choices that we made. We're not ready to forgive ourselves for not doing better when we didn't know better. Um, or, or maybe not even knowing what else is possible. Therefore yeah. saying it was great because they don't actually know what great is compared to. Totally. Yeah. And there's that as well. And then it's interesting that, you know, when women hear other women talk about, um, like a free birth or an unintervened physiologic birth will get like angry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like um, to say that they couldn't possibly have done that, or there was this and this and this reason why they couldn't have done that, or um, that that's not safe, et cetera, et cetera, like advocating against their own mm -hmm. empowerment. And it's like you said, it's, it's from the time that we're a kid and we see birth portrayed in movies. It's everything that every doctor, not just OBs, pushes into our minds about how incapable we are as women that, um, you know, convinces us that we need to defend basically our own victimization. So one thing that just came up, well, a lot of things just came up, but <laughs> I've been really like, keep playing with this concept lately of, you know, we live in a world now where we are primed with books and movies, right? And like a thought is actually implanted. A lot of our thoughts aren't actually starting from a natural place, right? It's the brain's inherently curious. So some book or some movie gives us a token and then we keep playing around with it to try to figure out, you know, what else that thing can do. And I think naturally, if a woman went into birth, not having any preconceived notion about what it would be, what to expect, how scary it could be, right? We wouldn't naturally go into it with fear. We'd be kind of taking every incremental experience as something new and we'd be processing it rather than focus on the future of the what ifs. I think naturally, as soon as we're starting to think about the future, what ifs, we tend to go into fear, thus making our body more tense, thus blocking the birth process from unfolding in a way that it, I believe was ultimately supposed to. Right. So that's one piece of it. And then for me with my birth with Zev, the first few hours that I went to the hospital. I, I intentionally picked a hospital that was supposed to be like, you know, good about natural and non-intervening. And when I went there, there was this whole thing about how, like, I didn't have to get an IV line. Like I didn't have to do all these things, but they highly suggest it. And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. And like, right off the hop, even though they said like, I could decline it and I did decline it. There was, I could tell there was already some sort of mark on my paper. Like, oh, this bitch, <laughs> she's going to be a real doozy. Mm -hmm. And they like, you know, they, they, they let me decline and I did. And for hours I was totally fine. Right. Hours I was laboring with my doula from Hawaii on FaceTime. And I was like in the shower, I was humming, like I was good. I was actually having a wonderful birth. 
And that nurse over that shift was wonderful. Like mm. it just, everything was easy. And then I even started to feel like, oh, I can fall asleep for a little bit of a nap. I literally fell asleep for a nap. And I woke up to literally a shift change where everything just went completely sideways on me. So yeah. I think this goes to show that, you know, of course, a lot of people are well intending, but I think this is kind of my call to some of you who are in this system as a nurse. And I do realize that just like with doctors, there's a lot of indoctrination step-by-step step that happens in your schooling. I know for nurses, especially, this can be a really hard system to wake up from or to be like, well, great. Now that I have this information, what do I do with it? So Sam, I guess to any of those people that might be listening, it kind of seems like in this world, if you wake up enough, then it's really like, do you keep complying with a system that you know is inherently flawed or do you break away from it? And like, what possibly does breaking away from it look like? Do you know any people like this that have broken away from the system like you? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that, you know, the first step is to do your own inner work, right? Because what the whole medical system does, and especially like the labor and delivery unit is that it places the doctors and the nurses in the role of savior and the women in the role of victims. And so it's really hard when you when you are feeling like this woman couldn't do it without me <laughs> day in and day out, right? To in, to investigate that and say, you know, wait, what am I taking out of this experience? Is that a true story? It obviously is not. Um, but being willing to look at that and how we're participating in this like saviorhood by attending births. Um, and, you know, if you are ready to do something different, um, knowing that there's options, I think that's just, it is just people don't know that there are other options, even besides licensed midwives, there are midwives who still practice unlicensed. There are also people who just attend births, um, where they are not being paid to be any type of medical provider. They are just there to be a witness. Um, and women do need support. Many times women don't wanna labor alone at home. They want other women there. That's always how women gave birth, was surrounded by the other women in their community. Um, and so it's not, it's not weird for a woman to want to be surrounded by other you know, wise women, but um, it's you know the job of the, mother who's birthing to be really intentional about who she invites into her birthing space. Mm -hmm. And then it's the job of the people who are attending to do their inner work of like, why am I showing up to this space? Am I here to literally just witness and to like be, um, hold hands with this mother on her path, or am I here to save her, you know? Um, and and as long as you're doing that inner work and you're showing up without that baggage, I think, then you're, you know, ready to support women in a really authentic way. And I wonder if some of that savior bit is why traditionally men were not as present at births, because I think it is kind of the natural male role to be kind of like savior protector. So mm. I just wonder if that's part of where that originally made the shift. Cause I think people automatically go to like the visual of it. Like, Oh, well, I don't want the guy seeing this, right. It's too vulnerable. Or what if it gets messy, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wonder if, you know, initially it really was kind of more that it is hard for, and I've obviously like, I've been there. It can be hard for your husband to watch you go through some of these moments and not intervene. Right. Mm -hmm. They, that's, it's what they do. They want to help. They want to protect. It might be, I would imagine just like when I see one of my kids sick, it's really hard to see them be sick and not be able to take it away from them. Mm -hmm. I would expect that some of that would certainly be shared with the husband. Was your husband at your birth? <laughs> yes, he was. And I agree that they have a really challenging time, like in general, not being able to intervene in a meaningful way. Um, at one point towards the end, Ben was just like hysterically laughing and crying at the same time, I think, because he just reached his emotional breaking point mm -hmm. of watching me go through so much pain. But 
I'm fortunate that he was like completely steadfast. And I mean, my birth was a really great example of set and setting because I was at home. If I had been in the hospital for sure would have gotten a C-section. I was a 70 hour labor. Um, and oh. I was begging to be taken to the hospital and get an epidural because I was in so much pain. Um, and he was very calmly just like unwavering about that not being an option. Um, but I just think about all the time if I had been there for sure. And so it's not about like, oh, I'm a stronger person. I had a home birth. It's, it's literally set and setting that I put myself in, you mm -hmm. know? Well, and I mean, I can attest to this. So <laughs> with Harley, so uh, those of you that might not know my background, I have two kids that are under two and they were like back to back. So Harley was about nine pounds and her labor was my most painful labor ever. Mm -hmm. I had her at home and that was Gordon's first baby. And most of the time I was like crushing his hand saying, somebody kill me. <laughs> I was like, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. He's like, yeah, okay. And I just, he tells me now that he looked at my midwife, like, is this normal? Is this, should we be concerned? And she took that cue as like, we're almost there. Like if she mm -hmm. wants to die, we're like, <laughs> we're about to transition. We're good. Then with yeah. my son river, I was literally river was my most peaceful, easy, like my birth with river. And I'm glad that it was my last one, but my birth with him was literally like the birth that I think in, in my head, like that's what birth is supposed to be like, mm. where I didn't even know I was in labor. I was still in complete denial. My midwife was like, no, you're about to have a baby. I was like, no, I can't be. I'm going to walk across the street and go get some, some snacks. And she was like, okay, you're not going to make it to the health food store, but go ahead, try. Um, so I try like walking across the street, my water like breaks all over the street. And I was like, okay, I think we need to go back. So wow. we went back and I was, I just, you know, Gordon was like on a rocking chair, listening to podcasts I think I maybe talked to him like once and I was almost asleep in the tub like I remember feeling like oh my labor is just completely stopped I'm like almost asleep and my midwife taps me on the shoulder she's like honey I think I think we want to get out of the tub I think you're about to have a baby and I was like no my mid it's like stalled I'm almost asleep just let me sleep she's like no you're not asleep the baby's coming out so can we just come on and literally had a baby in like five minutes and um, I almost it was almost so out of the blue that I had to blossom and be like, Oh, go get Gordon, go get Gordon. So mm. just to kind of show everybody like this spectrum, I went from literally not being able to release my husband's hands for hours being like, kill me to like almost not even remembering to tell my husband, Oh, like you might want to be here when your son comes out. Yeah. We almost, we almost missed it. <laughs> it's amazing. And I mean, and that just shows too that like, and I've, you know, there's, thousands of birth stories from the spectrum of like orgasmic, like intense, pleasurable birth to like severe pain. Mine was definitely like, I was like, I'm going to have the, such a amazing and meditative birth. And then it was like the most painful, painful thing ever. Um, but that no matter where you fall on that spectrum, like our bodies are designed to give birth and that we are all capable of doing it when it is not messed up right when it's not intervened with and then you start to get to the root of like why has birth been hijacked and a lot of people point to money but I think it's a lot more sinister than money um and it has to do with the fact that like women as you can attest to who have that type of birth experience are go they they are walking hand in hand with death you're saying somebody kill me like yeah death birth is like a death walk, you know, mm -hmm. and it's walking through the fire. And when you get to the other side, there is no one who can tell you what to do <laughs> anymore. No one who can make you question yourself. And it's such a small percentage of women who are having that type of birth experience, but it's such a profoundly life-changing impact for so many of them that if you can just imagine a world where every woman was having that experience, that would not be very good for the status quo. Yeah, and there wouldn't be much compliance. No, there wouldn't. So then I, I think that's where we really start to get to the why of why is there so much inherent trauma 
in the obstetric system and then trying more and more to be infiltrated into midwifery. And that really is why. And I mean, this is a total aside, but I've often wondered this and I've, you know, I, when I had my son Zev, I did have a male OB when I had to do the whole hospital shindig. I don't really understand why men go into that job. Like that, honestly, it can, has always concerned me. I remember it concerning me from being 13, which we're kind of getting into with like how well, well female exams go in some of those like early preteen years. I remember being like, it's a little weird that you would choose this job now. Like, yeah, I, I fully agree with you on that. Um, I think, well, there's been plenty of whistleblower female OBGYNs who have talked about their experience with like just overt sexual um, assault and rape in medical school of women in uh, of women patients, let alone the like subvert sexual assault, which is like a man putting his hands into your vagina when you are saying no during the birth process, for example, but yep. him not respecting that no, right? So that's like the more covert assault. Um, and then there's plenty of women who've spoken out about the like over assault. And we're, I know we're gonna get into the history of obstetrics, but the um, doctor who is credited as the father of gynecology, writes in his journal about not being interested and similarly as you not understanding why anyone would be interested in this type of um, of medicine until he realized that you got to look at vaginas, basically. Um, and I think that it's definitely a question we need to ask ourselves as a society, why is this something that we are condoning in a medical setting when it would never ever be condoned in any other setting. And I completely <laughs> agree. And I think maybe that's a good time. I mean, for any guys that are listening to this episode, sorry, but <laughs> this is important because some of you will have daughters and this is something that you want to consider. This is a hard thing to hear, but for a lot of young women, their very first experience of penetration is having a doctor do an exam when they're like, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, it's mm -hmm. completely unnecessary. It completely derails the entire process of, I believe, kind of like natural, safe progression of sexual experiences. I don't know, Sam, if this was the case for you, but I vividly remember that happening to me and me going home and just being like, what was that? Why would my parents have brought me to something like that? What is happening? I remember being like unbelievably panic stricken and questioning everything about what my parents just put me through and told me I had to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had a very similar experience. Um, and it's so it, again, like creates that cognitive dissonance, all these well-intentioned parents tell their daughters their entire young life, like not to let people touch them in that place. Or like, if someone makes you uncomfortable not to be around them and then to go into this place with a complete stranger most of the time and do something that most young girls can inherently feel is not right. Like their body is saying, no, everything about it is uncomfortable. And to be completely like robbed of your voice because you, you know, we want to be a good patient. It's that like grooming into mm -hmm. like being nice and not being disruptive. Right. Um, it just starts to imprint this, um, yeah, the story that we, to not listen to our bodies when it's telling us that something is wrong, um, which obviously has like far reaching implications in all areas of our lives is certainly what sets us up to have these birth experiences where we allow things to happen to us in the hospital that we didn't actually want to consent to. Um, and then that, but it's, you know, for most girls who go see an OB, that's not even the first time many of us have been seeing doctors since we were children, um, going to our pediatricians, getting genital exams, getting, you know, stripped down and like examined, being told that this is a completely normal thing normal to do, thing. even though it's totally unnecessary for a healthy child to be examined in that way. You know, I was just 
my son, we were laughing about this the other day. So obviously Zed today is his birthday. So it's <laughs> funny that this episode Zed would come up a lot. So he's only ever been to his seven day checkup. So we had, you know, like our doctor and at the time we had, um, I think he's still definitely regarded as a pretty like well-to-do pediatrician that's certainly gone against the green in Santa Monica. And he was a, he was a great advocate, thankfully for us in the hospital where he actually, from the time Zev was born, he actually was Zev's chain of custody in the hospital to make sure that no vaccines were administered. So he was like, literally he had hospital credentials and they couldn't take Zev anywhere away from me without him present. So he was a great doctor. But I mean, I remember at that seven day checkup, I was like, so when do I have to come back again? He's like, your baby's fine, right? I'm like, yeah, your baby's fine. He's like, great. Your baby's ever sick. Yeah, you know where to find me. But like, other than that, bye, have a nice life. And totally. I remember in my head being like, what? Like, is that what we do? Because I'd been coming off of obviously having Sarai with, you know, cerebral palsy and like, you have to check this. She's got to get this EEG. And then just this idea of like, oh, so I just bring him like only if he's sick. Okay, great. And then all of a sudden I remember just like, years had gone by like to this day Zev barely ever gets sick and if he does it's like this little like <laughs> like Zoolander kind of cough the kid has just been nine years of like the perfect health you could possibly imagine and he is my least intervened child up to this point like just nine years of no intervention healthy like sleeping good eating good like just a resilient kid so I can attest to the fact that you know going and I'm not, again, I'm going back to this place of saying like, I'm not saying that doctors are inherently bad and there isn't a time and place because I do believe there is a time and a place. But for Zev, that time and place has never come. Like mm-hmm. he's just never, it's never even been like on the edge, you know? There have mm-hmm. been some on the edge moments with Sarai where I'm like, is mama going to stitch it or are we going to go to the hospital? It's like, let's roll the dice. Okay, mom's going to stitch it. And it's ended <laughs> up okay. You know, that's how we roll in our house. But yeah. Yeah, think- and it- Oh, sorry. I I was just going to say, and even if you are not quite ready to fully opt out of the system and you're wanting to bring your kids to be seen or your kid is sick or whatever, parents forget that they are the ultimate authority in that room. So you can say, no, don't remove my child's diaper. She doesn't need a genital exam or, Mm -hmm. or no, I don't want that test done or that intervention or vaccine or whatever. Um, And, you know, I think parents like, yeah, we, if we want our kids to be good advocates for their bodily autonomy, we need to get over our own fear of being disruptive and start advocating for them, you know? And having been that disruptor in the room of like, no, we're not going to do that. Most likely they're going to ask you like two or three more times just to check and make sure. (laughs) So you've got to really be on your A game of understanding why you're saying no, because they'll likely try different techniques to try to talk you around and into it. Mm -hmm. So just know that, you know, the way that the system is currently operating, if this is a path that you're wanting to consider or going, there is slightly an uphill battle and you have to be willing to go against the grain and you need to not worry about the doctor not liking you. I've had plenty of doctors in my life, not like me at all. And naturally that will happen if you are a system disruptor or even just kindly saying like, no, I mean, for me, there was one time that Zeb actually did slam his fingers. He got his fingers slammed in a door at camp. And I really like, it was right on the edge. I was like, did it cut down to the bone? I don't really Mm. know. Like we're going to go get it checked out. So we went to urgent care and I literally had to say, I respectfully decline. I respectfully decline like a hundred times. This woman was bent on (laughs) trying to get me to give him a tetanus shot. And I was just like, I respectfully decline. She's like, but you, and I was like, I respectfully decline. You've got to make sure that there's like, a. Sometimes if they feel like you're trying to go on the offense, it just ramps Mm -hmm. things up more. I just really like softened my face and was like, I I completely understand where you're coming from. Respectfully, I decline. And she wanted me to match her level. And eventually when I still did not, she was like, okay, like, okay. Yeah. And so that's where like knowing your rights is so important, but it's also why so more and more people, instead of like going through the stress and the like, politics and rigmarole of like navigating the system are just choosing to like opt out entirely you know which is 
Yeah. Well, and I think there are some people and maybe opting out entirely is, I mean, I think there are probably a variety of ways that that gets brought to life. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a doctor in our area here that has, obviously I'm not going to name them, but they've opted out by way of, they still have their MD credentials and licensure and all that, but they operate like an off the grid medicine group. That's just, you know, like a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that knowledge. And I think if you have that depth of knowledge, but you've also learned to see beyond that and not be primed into only seeing things from the system's perspective, that's actually a fantastic care provider, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And what you just described as, you know, like a private membership um, is what my business operates as as well. And that's like really the only option for medical providers right now who are wanting to leave the system entirely, because as we've seen, especially with COVID, like if you are wanting to treat patients differently or go against the mainstream, like you are going to get your license called into question or possibly taken away. Um, and so, you know, doctors, like you said, who have, taken their education and are wanting to do something different are really actually at danger of, you know, legal ramifications of that. Um, and so that's, that also is what I mean by opting out, right. Is like mm -hmm. finding, finding a way around the system instead of trying to change it from within. So let's jump in for a second because I want to get to John Marion Sims and mm. how he really kind of like I mean birthed is kind of a punny use of the word here but birthed what we use today in terms of practice and structure in western obstetrics and gynecology do you want to maybe kind of go into a little bit of you know what he was doing at the time and why you think we've decided that this is what we should adopt as a practice for all. Sure. Yeah. I, so there were a lot of doctors at the time that were starting to attend births at home because what they were finding was if they could gain the family's trust by attending the birth, then the family would see them for medicine. And this is at the time where like allopathy was still on the fringes. Allopathy mm -hmm. is like what we know as medicine now. Um, and homeopathy and traditional practices were still the norm. And so in an effort to kind of like have more people convert to allopathic medicine, they realized, oh, if you get the baby, you get the family basically. Mm, so they were starting yeah. to attend births at home more as a marketing kind of, technique literally yeah um, okay. so he was just one of uh these these people that was starting to attend birth but he's credited with like the surgical aspect of obstetrics um and so like I already kind of mentioned he was not interested in gynecology at all until he realized that it was about women's reproductive systems um and he literally has journals calling it like the most memorable time of his life. And he basically what he convinced um, plantation owners to do was to pay him to treat their slaves, because if you were a slave, um, you weren't worth much if you couldn't reproduce. And so some of these women had, you know, injuries from past birth traumas and or infertility issues and things like that. Um, and so if they were having an issue that the plantation owners would send these slaves to him and pay him to treat them, he was almost never successful. <laughs> he treated, um, you know, he had three slaves in particular that he really um, treated the most, Lucy and Arca and Betsy. And um, he treated one of them like 30 surgeries in four years and was like never successful. But all these surgeries were done without anesthesia. Yeah, with just opium. So mm -hmm. they were basically high, but could feel all the pain. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people will argue like, oh, anesthesia wasn't like popular at the time. And that is true. Like we weren't doing many surgeries without anesthesia anyway. Um, but there's still, there's a racist aspect to this that still persists today, where if you poll medical students, most medical students still believe that black people do not feel pain as much as white people. Um, 
with black women in the hospital are four times more likely to die from all causes during childbirth. And that is solely based on neglect. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there was certainly an aspect to that happening here that is still persisting in obstetrics. Um, and he was selling tickets to these surgeries and allowing other men basically to come watch. So there's, you know, I guess under the guise that it was like a medical education, um, but he was making a lot of money off of it. He wasn't being very successful and he was, you know, essentially exposing these women. There's been some people who argue like, well, they consented because they wanted to be, uh, you know, healed. And if they really didn't want it to happen, they could have just ran away. But that is like, well, I mean, that if all the slaves didn't want to consent, could have just ran away. Then exactly. They wouldn't have slavery. So obviously they couldn't run away because they were slaves. Exactly. Like you yeah. have to put yourselves into the minds of these women. Like they had absolutely no choice. We have no historical recording of their feelings or thoughts or consent or anything like that. Um, and so there's, there's no record that they were like wanting this type of treatment. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, it, and then this became like lauded as these medical, um, you know, these wonderful medical advancements. And this was well, around the time. If we yeah. go back for a moment, cause I think to me, one of the things that is clearly the most trauma inducing and to think of like, where someone would have come up with this and felt like it was somehow acceptable in practice to me only makes sense if we're talking about it in the context that we are, which is absolutely horrific. Some of the physical instrumentation and practices that are used in OB exams in general and gynecology in general are really invasive. They're, they're definitively, like if you just look at them, they are kind of torture, torturous in how you even look at them. So to me, like a lot of this era of, you know, what they would have called as slave medicine is where they, they used these kind of like torture techniques, because at the time, the people that were creating these ideas really not only <clears throat> were intentionally dehumanizing these people, but I think their whole perspective of the demographic they were working on was that of like some sort of dehumanized group. And the idea that we've somehow carried this on and practiced for so many years without question to me is really curious. And then I guess, do you know, has anyone really called this into question? Like, are there people that have kind of whistle blown this over time? Um, yeah. And, you know, from the black slave women, which were certainly the first women to receive the brunt of all of this experimentation. And obviously obstetrics isn't the only area in which we've done medical experimentation on black people, right? Um, <clears throat> like Tuskegee experiment and Henrietta Lacks um, comes to mind, but from there, the only women who received this type of treatment were women who went to hospitals, which at the time was like women who were not married or prostitutes or women who- mm. So still were, kind of more like lower income outcasts <laughs> from society. Mm -hmm, because the treatment was so terrible, your chances of dying were so high. Um, and generally just the conditions of the hospitals were so disgusting and dirty. Like, I mean, this was before sanitation was understood. So met, uh, doctors would literally go from like autopsying a cadaver to like the birth room and women were dying from infections at a rate of like 50% in the hospital. Um, and yeah, so much of it has persisted, even though it has not had a positive impact. I can say that with extreme uh, confidence on maternal fetal death uh, survivor rates at all. Actually, it's made it much worse. Um, and there are people blowing the whistle on this. I mean, like I already mentioned the Free Birth Society, Yolanda Norris Clark, she dives into this a lot. Um, and then kind of there's a, a larger and larger group of women, I would say, who are coming to understand that this, you know, they've either had personal experience being traumatized 
by the obstetric system or, um, you know, in the, in the event of having a daughter or something like that, start to look into it more deeply and are, you know, kind of awakened to the problems with it. So. so maybe that's a good kind of segue here is understanding, you know, from the perspective of like, if you have a daughter that's kind of nearing this age when traditionally in the United States, we would know kind of what things we would lead them into next. I know one of the things that you hear this part of the system talk about a lot is like, oh, we've got to get them tested for HPV, tested for HPV, pap smear, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I had a nurse or somebody that was like kind of paramedical in the, the office come to me and be like, you know, if you're not sexually active, if you got a strain and you weren't introducing any new strains, your body would just heal yourself. <clears throat> and I remember telling my mom that I'm like, the well, whoever she was told me this I'm like so why do I have to keep getting this my mom I remember my mom doing this skip and being like it basically was like a, I don't know because you're supposed to like she wasn't equipped with the right answer or an answer to stand against what I had asked her and I ended up having a variety of unnecessary surgeries when I was in my teens over things that like now when I look back and I talk to some <clears throat> people like completely unnecessary and one particularly at age 14 where looking back, there was a high likelihood that would have made me never be able to carry a child again. So mm. some of these things are being done as interventions to young women without really their understanding of what's happening mm -hmm. and potentially putting them in risky situations and <coughs> damaging their ability to birth children later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, unfortunate that, you know, first of all, yes, pap smears are the same as other screenings. There's not a lot of evidence to show that they actually have any beneficial effect mm -hmm. on, um, you know, disease outcomes. They're just traumatizing. They're quite traumatizing. They're totally unnecessary. Like you said, there's, you know, a lot of evidence that if you have the precancerous uh, cells on your cervix that pap smears are partially like screening for, that it will naturally resolve on its own. Um, and then a lot of girls start seeing a gynecologist because they have like period cramps or headaches or acne and they're automatically put on the birth control pill, which is mm. like a whole other conversation. Yeah, but, that's a part two. That's yeah, a whole other thing. That, um, you know, but another band-aid that they're not told the actual risks of like informed consent has come up a lot, but not told the actual risks of, and then when they get off of it 20 years later and realize that it's going to be challenging for them to conceive a baby, it's like, what a devastating blow that is. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then also things like the Gardasil vaccine, which has done devastating oh, yeah. things to women's health. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't, I think a lot of in obstetrics, there is a lot of, I don't know, like the, the, even the people who are administering the tests don't necessarily understand why, <laughs> like I'm thinking I've literally before this, this conversation, I had a phone call with my sister who's pregnant with her third child and she, they were telling her that she had high fluid and she asked them, well, what does that mean? And they were like, well, it's not good. And she's like, well, why? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it, well, what happens? I don't know. You just have high fluid. And when you start questioning kind of like, but, the, but what you find is that most of these diagnoses of high fluid or low fluid or whatever are really just there to number one, either protect doctors from liability mm -hmm. um, or number two, to pour money into insurance companies by giving you all of these high cost interventions. So, um, and, and gynecology is no different. Well, then I don't, the statistic that I was looking at from the time that a doctor during the course of pregnancy shares any information with you that's perceived as not typical, your likelihood of then having hypertension after that is like 80% mm -hmm. naturally because then you're stressed out and you're like, oh my God, something's going to happen to my baby. When like mm -hmm. probably none of that really needed to get set into motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but again, so all of this has to do with like, if we can 
you know, not push our daughters down this unnecessary system, we're already giving them the power to say, I know what's happening in my body. You Mm -hmm. can't tell me what's happening in my body because I'm the authority on my own body and I know best what I need or don't need, you know? Absolutely. Um, So I think when, because we've kind of talked a lot about both maternal and infant mortality in our country. And out of 10 of the first world countries, we are actually last. So we come in 10th out of 10 first world countries in birth outcomes. And one other thing that I found really interesting is that a lot of kind of the the data suggests that where we lack the most is in our postpartum support because actually 52% of those maternal and fetal deaths happen in the postpartum phase. And they were quantifying postpartum as even after 48 hours after the birth. So it's kind of like in that, that, you know, baby moon phase or that time when you're kind of left your own devices, which I find interesting because this would not directly implicate the hospital or something that took place per se at the hospital. So I'm wondering you know, what if any in kind of this like radical free birthing sort of perspective, what are the things that you think might attribute to this in kind of general postpartum care for women that wouldn't, that would have gone through the Western medical? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and you know, 10 out of 10 is bad. And then a statistic I've heard is that out of all the world we're in the 40s, 46. Yeah. So even like behind second world countries. Yeah. Yes. Um, What contributes to that? I mean, I think a lot of women don't understand or aren't given the information to know that every intervention that you uh, admit to at the hospital increases your risk of poor outcomes, right? So epidurals are not without, um, some risk to the baby. Um, C-sections put you at an increased risk of hemorrhage. Also, a lot of doctors intervene in the removal of the placenta, which puts you at a much higher risk of hemorrhaging. Um, Then when we talk about like the neglect or um, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but yeah, basically neglect in hospitals where women aren't treated properly for hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot more to black women than white women. Um, not taken seriously if they say that there's that pain. something doesn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, women's bodies need their hormonal flow to go as nature intended in order to heal properly from birth. And so, uh, and that means like your uterus contracting to the right size and your tissue getting enough blood flow and nursing your baby properly. And all of that requires this really complex, like hormonal symphony that's happening. And every intervention we make interferes with that hormonal flow to some extent. So any type of pain medication that you get, but also anything as simple as like a lot of stress and talking happening between the doctor and the patient or the doctor and the nurses, like that can impact hormones as well. So to interrupt your body's natural healing process kind of after the birth. Um, And then talking about how infants are affected by the way the system works, right? So after an infant is born, which usually involves some type of like pulling out of the vagina in a backwards lying position, which puts a lot of pressure on their heads, right? Um, Then they're taken away from the mother, which what that baby needs to start to breathe properly and have its own hormonal matrix start working is to be skin to skin with that mother right away, not have their umbilical cord cut until it stopped pulsing. But it's usually the umbilical cord is cut. This also gets into some like sinister stuff because those that cord blood is usually taken by the hospital to be sold, right? Um, taken from the mom. Now it doesn't have all of its stem cells that it needs or its oxygenated blood. Then it's put into like a cold area to be like weighed and all of this super unnecessary case taking type stuff. Um, 
this is interfering with both baby and mom's natural physiological processes at this point. And then unfortunately, most babies are also given a hep B vaccine right away, a vitamin K shot and a antibiotic to their eyeballs, all three totally unnecessary, um, not without risk of side effects. So, you know, this is like the protocol that everyone gets put under. Um, there is a risk to cesarean section as well. Like there's a risk that, um, you know, babies won't handle a cesarean section very well. I already mentioned increased risk of hemorrhage for moms, especially with subsequent cesareans, um, because if you have scar tissue in your uterus, oftentimes the placenta will have a difficult time detaching from scar tissue. So mm. that increases your risk of hemorrhage as well. And in a country where one in three births is a cesarean section, we're obviously increasing our risk of maternal mortality a lot just through that surgery alone. So, um, so one of the other things that I saw that I think is interesting. And I, I, I am on board with this idea that we're kind of drawing a defining line between licensed midwife and kind of more of like a traditional midwife or what have you. So my assumption is that this is regarding licensed midwives in the hospital setting. But when you look at that, that chart that basically put us 10th out of 10 first world countries, we only have about 15 midwives attending a thousand births per capita compared to in a lot of other countries, like closer to 80. So there's definitely something to be said about, you know, whether, and of course we've kind of pulled this thread that even when something is trying to maintain its traditional roots, eventually when you when you kind of put this like academic licensure aspect of it up on a pedestal, eventually one becomes like the other. Mm. So we could argue that a lot of midwives today don't necessarily function the same as a more traditional midwife, mm. but certainly even just that sort of perspective seems to have a positive income, positive impact on um, maternal positive outcomes, right? So we can see that there's definitely a correlation there. You know, mm. I want to kind of tie a few bows on things um, and surely we'll do another episode because <laughs> I think the whole, like the birth control aspect alone is a whole other episode that I would love to dig into. You know, to, to say it from my perspective, because I know a lot of people, birth can be just like an incredibly triggering conversation in general. I've had everything from the triggering, awful hospital birth to I had a home birth with a traditional midwife, not a licensed midwife who did everything wrong. And my daughter's life was literally saved by a doula. So I'm coming from a perspective of I've had a home birth where everything that could have gone wrong at the end went wrong. And I have a daughter that special needs because of it. So I'm certainly not in the position of saying like, you know, there's no point or purpose to Western medicine because certainly there is, and there can be, but I do know that, you know, I've kind of had this spectrum of births where I had one, I had two at home, one with a licensed midwife, one with a traditional midwife I had one in the hospital and then I had one with a traditional midwife in a birth center, like, and not a birth center, like in a hospital, but like a little cottage that was mm -hmm. like, you know, like not mm -hmm. like people would imagine, but like a tiny little cottage where it basically was like being at home, but it happened mm. to be closer than my house to the mm -hmm. hospital. <laughs> so it was kind of like a good stop gap because we live out in the country and it was the middle of winter when I was having river. <clears throat> so I think, you know, there are a variety of ways to give birth. And I think the intent of this conversation is really to help you look more at what's operating beneath the surface and how many things you have accepted because of this kind of like cascading trajectory of information where it's like oh well that that makes sense and that makes sense but really like something only makes sense because the previous 10 things made sense so I think we're really just trying to not not say that one thing is like bad and you should never do it or not shame anyone for having you know chosen to go about it the other route or hey like still right now choosing to go about it that way I think our intent is more to help uncover there's some decrepit aspects of some of these practices that 
sometimes maybe they save lives, but probably a vast majority of the time they change your emotional state either during the event itself or in events leading up to that one big crescendo moment of birth that are likely attributing to some level of negative outcome. And I think unless we ask the hard questions and we do a little bit of digging personally, we'll never really be able to stand up for ourselves or make the changes that need to be made. Because I I do certainly believe that there is a time and a place for intervention, but the reality is that there are likely 99% of interventions that are either unnecessary in their beginning phase or are only a cascading effect of interventions like you talked about, where it's like, Mm -hmm. we're only now having to intervene because of a previous intervention. So, yeah. And I, could I just jump in for a second and just say, um, I agree, like what we need to under, it's all about dispelling fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're like programmed to think that home birth is such a scary thing when what the statistics really show us is that giving birth at home is actually safe, safer in terms of outcome than giving birth in a hospital. This is part of teaching and empowering women to know when something is wrong, because 99% of the time, if something is wrong and you need to get to a hospital, the women, the woman will know that and Mm -hmm. like can go to the hospital. Right. Um, but, but on the flip side of that, if you are in the hospital, you're actually increasing your risk of all of these things happening. Like we just said, and that's really only looking at home births attended by midwives and hospital births because no one is studying unattended births and how Mm -hmm. safe those are. Um, I wanted to just differentiate that like licensed midwives can attend home births in some States, only some States licensed midwives and it's that that's where it can get, you know, a little bit like inviting the wolf in sheep's clothing into Mm -hmm. your home because most women think, oh, she's a home birth midwife, but don't realize that her licensure requires that she transfer you if your baby is breached or she transfer you if you lose X amount of blood or like all of these things in order to not lose her licensure Mm -hmm. that require her to intervene in a way that takes away your consent. Um, And so I think just dispelling fear so that women are able to make an actual informed choice that is heart centered, um, instead of feeling like they have to make a choice based out of like risk, uh, you know, alleviating risk is exactly the goal that, you know, I'm aiming to like, um, to do. And I can attest to what you were saying about the like inherently we know when something is wrong. And the reality is that with Sarai, I knew that something was wrong. I kept telling people something's wrong and my midwife completely ignored me. And what's interesting is I'm pretty clear that on my birth, my midwife thought of me in such a high regard. Like she's so strong. She said like in her head, I was just going to have this perfect, easy birth. So it made her not look for what was right in front of her. So I kind of had this reverse scenario of Mm. like, she didn't intervene when I was sitting there saying like, no, something is terribly wrong Mm -hmm. because she was like, no, no, you're just a first time mom. And I was like, no, no, something's very, very wrong. Mm. And the reality is if she hadn't kept trying to talk me out of it, I would have gone to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I probably would have been fine. So I think this is that like fine balance where the reality is like, not that I don't think I would have ever been in a place where I've been like free birthing is an option for me, (laughs) but at the time, had I been free birthing, I'm like, I would bet any amount of money that I would have ended up at the hospital. And right. That just goes to show that if you really let your body communicate to you what it needs, mm-hmm. the outcome realistically could have been significantly better. Cause I kept being convinced by her that obviously I was wrong, which carried yeah. on for honestly, 48 hours after that mm. birth. So, you know, discernment here is key getting to be really clear on learning how to trust yourself. And, you know, as a mom, we have a lot of mom instincts that sometimes we just kind of push aside or, you know, we don't want to ruffle feathers or like, it's so weird that I would say that, you know, start to trust your instinct and don't be so quick to push away intuitive hits that come to you as a mom, because Mm -hmm. your body is programmed that way, right? We're, We're programmed with how to protect our kids. And often, 
you know, because of this whole, like, well, I'm not a doctor. We stop Mm -hmm. listening to the clear cues that our mind is giving us with how to care for our kids. So Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the goal here is no matter what you choose to do from this point, allow that to have more time with the microphone and feel more confident or comfortable playing around with it because we do all have that ability. And for many of you, it's been quite literally programmed out of you on purpose. Yeah, it's learning to listen to that again and to um, give yourself permission to be the, to trust yourself enough to be the authority over your own body and the body of your baby. So, yes, I love that. Yeah. So, I'm going to hit the rapid fire questions and then we'll make sure that you tell our listeners and viewers <laughs> where they can find you. Okay. What's the biggest mistake you've made in your life and how did it impact who you've become? Wow. Interesting question. Um, the biggest mistake I made in my life was, um, letting not having solid enough boundaries with people that I was working with, um, and not being fully honest about who I was. And that really led me to a whole Phoenix experience of getting canceled, losing everyone I thought loved me and that I loved. And then, but that was quickly transmuted into something beautiful because it cleared the space for everything positive that's in my life now to come through. And I think that probably speaks volumes to a lot of people because I think a lot of the last two years, people have been afraid to be honest about who they are and what they think in fear of losing all their friends. And the reality is if you're going to lose those friends over being yourself, they weren't really supposed to be your friend. Exactly. If Sam hadn't have become a radical free birth advocate, what would you have become instead? Mm. What was the backup? The backup plan was definitely a surf instructor slash surf shop owner. That might be the retirement plan as well. I can picture that. I bet on that. Yeah. So the next one is if you had to pick one area of societal life that if we could just change this one thing, the ripple would help heal all of the other things, what would be the first thing you would focus on? Mm, oh my gosh. I don't, I hate to be like so on topic, but if every woman could have a birth experience that was not intervened with, mm-hmm. it would take one generation for this to ship to turn everything. around, I think. I love that. Honestly, so. before this conversation, I don't think I ever would have considered that, but it mm. really is ultimately the most important and powerful rite of passage that we have as human beings. It right? is. I yeah. think both for male and female, right? Like it, having a child, even obviously I'm not a male, but from having watched the experience, it changes you forever if you stay connected to and attached from it. And maybe that even brings up why there's such an intent to destroy the family and prevent us from having kids. Yeah. But- well, think how demasculinating it is to be witness to your wife's obstetric assault. Oh, right? and yeah. Not be oh. able to intervene. Oh, yeah. you're like, yeah. wait, you're doing what? No. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So if you had to create, and this one's, it's a loaded one, but I think I'm going somewhere and it's important. (laughs) If you were going to create an ideal president, which three people would you combine alive or dead? Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. Three people I would combine alive or dead. Um, I, am definitely partial to Dr. Zach Bush. I don't know if you follow him. Same, same. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, I think that, well, Inanna is a goddess who was potentially a real person. She's obviously dead, thousands of years old in Sumer. Um, Her teachings, I think, are really profound for women. And it's a very balanced, divine masculine, divine feminine approach. I'm reading about her a lot right now. So that's why this just popped into my mind. Um, Third person, man. I mean, I think that I feel like I'm pandering to him at this point, but because Dr. Gabor Mate is like so tuned into the way that our culture is specifically designed to make people sick, um, that that is something that we're really lacking um, understanding of right now. So 
And that we was talk a about really that a hard lot question. This, it is. It's an intentionally hard question, <laughs> and I, I love watching the, the look of terror on people's faces. Oh my like, god! No. <laughs> um, but we do talk a lot on the show about how having a sick group of people, both physically and mentally makes it very easy to control and manipulate. So like ultimately Mm. the system doesn't want us well because then we become very hard to control. Mm. So I I love your picks. Certainly I can resonate with some of them. (laughs) You can only raise your kids with one book. What is this one book? Hmm. Um, I think it would be, oh my gosh, I can see see it in my mind but it would be Plato's um man what is the book exactly I don't know if I'm going to be able to look it up but his most famous book we can put it in the show now okay um and yeah the Republic um because you know what we've what it, it what it shows is how to critically think and how to learn how to learn, you know, and I think that critically thinking is an art that has obviously been lost um, or, destroyed to, or destroyed intentionally for our children. So, um, and the last one is what is the most important ingredient of raising an epic child? Oh my gosh. It is, you know, oh, it's hard to pick just one, but I would say maintaining their innocence. Mm, I agree. Mm -hmm. For as long as humanly possible. And Mm -hmm. really every aspect of what is currently taking place right now is aimed directly like a target on their back to destroy their innocence. So Exactly. And it's having them like having them be more connected to you than they are to their peers, you know, yeah. And to the outside. Yeah. Well, Sam, it was amazing having you on the show. <laughs> Where can our viewers and listeners look you up, follow you, connect with you? Thank you so much. So yeah, you can find uh, me at Madre Terra. It's M-A-D-R-E-T-E-R-R-A dot P-M-A on Instagram. And then my website is madreterra.love. So I have a private members association that, um, you can join if you're interested in kind of like diving into more of these things, um, and learning more. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We will do a part two and dive into (laughs) birth control. And I'm sure so many other things. Oh my God. Lots of love to you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Modern Good. For more information on Break Method, head over to breakmethod.com. And to check out my workshop and teaching schedule, busygold.com. I'll see you next week.